you don't always get asked to bring on guests more than once. Oh, who am I kidding? We've had some awesome guests and we've had lots of different requests, but the most recent guest, the guest that you're about to listen to today, Mr. Jamie Garbett, is one of our first interviews back. I feel like the top 15 or 20 episodes we ever did, and he blew us away, it was one of the most listened to episodes for quite a long time. And we talked about all the different ways that Jamie has got involved in real estate from a uh, sales perspective, an investment perspective, construction perspective, everything, a wealth of information. I definitely recommend if you're listening to this episode and you haven't gone back to the beginning, go listen to the earlier episode with Jamie. It is fantastic. And you learn so much in listening to him talk. In any case, today we are here to interview Jamie to talk about what's been happening with him the past few years. Obviously, it's been a long few years for a lot of people and a lot is going on and Jamie has not slowed down. He's got some big projects coming up, lots of new feedback and information and knowledge to share with people. If you are listening, whether to improve your personal financial situation or just to better understand the market, Jamie talks about previous experience, current experience, what's happening in the marketplace right now, and his predictions going forward from a personal perspective and an investment perspective. So tune in, listen in. And as always, these shows are presented by myself, Dean and Derek from Thrive Mortgage Co. Three Partners with a primary focus on helping our clients create more wealth in real estate. We really do believe mortgages can be done better with good advice and transparency. So if you're interested in reaching out to set up a consultation, just send us a message on Instagram at Thrive Mortgage Co. or find our website thrivemortgage.ca. Guys, I hope you love this episode. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, shout us out, and listen in. You're going to love this. See you on the other side. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Jamie Garbett. It has been far too long since we've had you on. And I'm, I was looking back at the last time we had the show, had you on the show. And I think it was, honestly, I think it was before we hit episode 20. So really cool for you to uh, have joined us that early in the process. And here we are in the hundreds. Uh, welcome you back again. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, my friend. Thank you for having me back. It's great to be back. I think a lot has changed in the world since last time I was on. So look forward to catching up on it. Just a little bit, just a little bit. So, Jamie, you know, I mean, I could count on, we were just literally going over the 15 different things that we could talk about today. We're going to try not to talk about 15 different things, but there are so many different reasons that we can have you come on and talk a little bit about your experience, talk about what's happened since then, and talk a little bit about where you're going and all that kind of stuff. But I think what's important to do is to start by prefacing and giving people just a snippet of your backstory. Uh, listeners, go check out that previous episode. We'll, we'll put the show notes in there. Uh, Jamie is, uh, is a friend uh, and also a peer in the industry. And... Uh, uh, someone that loves to, as we started off the show here, uh, experiment with real estate and learn and try different things. And I think that's the key here. Uh, you're a guy who likes to actually uh, put the proof in the pudding and, and try things out as opposed to just telling someone how it's done, which is cool. So in the previous episode we had with you, you shared with us uh, your experiences with long-term rentals, vacation properties, um, builds heritage homes, and so much more. And since then, you've obviously done a lot as well. So I figure we start off kind of like where we ended and maybe Maybe just spend a couple minutes and you can talk to us about what kinds of investment real estate projects you've been working on since the last time we had you on in 2020. Yeah, I guess going over my resume of what I've dabbled in over the years, I, I've, I've been a, a, I guess, a landlord for half of my life. And I and and the way I like to say it is I, I think I'm trying everything so that I make the mistakes that my clients or friends won't. Um, and, and what I'm getting at is I, I have a long history of, uh, you know, owning rental condos, uh, a couple rental homes. I tried a vacation property in the Okanagan. I had a few rental properties in the States in Atlanta that was, went terrible. Uh, so I, I've, I've experienced the different worlds of being a landlord for a nice, simple one bedroom or two bedroom condo, and also a house that has fallen apart, and also a house that is in a neighborhood that is that is pretty sketchy. And, and also I've I've upset a strata before and had them change the bylaws to restrict rentals. So, so I have I have a lot of war stories and and kind of my my take back from that is I did a I did a lot to try to figure out uh, 
what I'm into and what I'm not into. And, and it just overcomplicated. I guess I did so many more transactions than I needed to to get to the same spot. So now after last few years, I've taken a step back, try to realize what type of real estate investor I want to be. And, and the future is, is I'm getting into more of that commercial uh, side of the investing life. I think it's a part of a journey. A lot of people start in residential and then one day they evolve into commercial. And the opportunities that I'm most drawn to are outside of the lower mainland. So I've, I've taken on uh, a project, well, I will be taking on a project for doing a commercial rental building in Parksville, which is exciting. Uh, early stages, never done one before, pretty excited about it. And then I'm in the process of trying to, I'm at the fourth reading coming up for a heritage revitalization in New West, which is another project I'm working on. And I was going to build a house in Deep Cove, but that's that's changing too. So doing a few different things here. Heritage, new uh, modern in Deep Cove was on the list, but now it's not. And then uh, some multifamily commercial on the island. The rental building play is interesting because I, th I feel like those are becoming more and more needed and, and communities and the government are really pushing for those, right? So um, going into that, maybe you don't want to share all the details, but what type of incentives are you receiving from the community to build that, if any? Maybe I'll take a step back and why rental building and on the island. You know, I, I think, what, where do I begin with this? The, the, uh, the return, so the, the cash flow on the island is great. And, and I guess why rental building? You know, I, I sell real estate, I do condos and townhouses and my whole life I thought let's build to sell, build to sell. And the message I keep receiving in a lot of these podcasts are some of the biggest mistakes these, these investors and developers have made over the years. One repeat pattern I hear is they sold, they sold too much or they sold a property they didn't want to sell or they sold, you know, that ultimately selling is one of the number one regrets that I seem to hear from people that have that are ahead of me in this game. So I thought to myself, what is, you know, I, I'm, I have a history of projects and renovating homes and building homes. And I like that process. I like creating something. I like processing land into something that is meaningful. And um, what do you build when you like the building process and you don't want to sell that kind of limits what you focus on and, and beds and sheds or call it rental housing and light industrial are two very attractive, uh, you know, property types. And I'm just drawn more to the rental aspects. So uh, the, the, the draw into this is creating a commercial asset that you don't want to sell or you can sell one day, but it's very desirable to sell. Um, and the advantage is building housing, uh, market rents or affordable, is one of the biggest levers you can pull with banks if you qualify and, and you know, say, uh, the land, uh, the land to construction cost ratio on the island where I'll be building, the land is much cheaper over here. If I were doing the same project over here, the land might be 40% of the cost, but over there it's probably closer to 20% of the cost. And ultimately, CMHC wants uh, wants more housing, and they're you know we're in that process. So I don't know the offer yet, but from some initial conversations. You know, it's a far larger loan than I would get in other asset classes. It's a far more desirable rate. And I'm going to learn an absolute ton about the process, not just about what one, what it takes to qualify for a CMHC loan. My hope is also to gain a track record of doing this. Once you have it, you're going to qualify for more. But um, the energy requirements, for example, you know, if you get a certain energy requirement, that affects your rate. You know, if you have a mix of affordable versus market rent, that affects what you qualify for. So there's, it's, it's really interesting for me to understand how they evaluate the loan and, and what those rates look like. And the rates ultimately reflect the product and they encourage you to develop certain things with that. So I, I'm early days, don't have a lot to share yet, but excited to learn. Yeah, that's a very interesting process. The whole CMHC process when it comes to multifamily is something that we haven't dug into on this on this show and it's something we should because it, it's it's a very backwards po process if you think of like buying a traditional residential home and involving cmhc they're usually not first in the game where in your case you're you're dealing with cmhc directly and almost building a product to suit to your point the needs of cmhc and and that's ultimately how it's in in a way is going to design the the purpose of your building and and, and what it looks like, I would assume. To give you an example right now, we we have a development permit in place. So we have some certainty that we can develop X building on the island. And the fun part right now is we have a consultant list that we just confirmed. So all the engineers, the structural, the civil, you name it, all the engineers, the architect, they all come together. And we have to uh, 
basically marry these conversations of an early development permit, get all the engineers together. And so, you know, you have the builders hats, the engineers that, that design their building, but also at the same time, understand what CMHC requires to get certain rates. And there's, there's certain professionals that help that, but marrying the world of building a building and construction with CMHC and what they want you to build, that's like, we're on the forefront. I, I, I feel like this is the, it, this is a new thing. And, and maybe you guys know, but I, I just jumped into this in the last two years. But it, it's for me, it's kind of exciting to understand, like, there's a reason why they want more housing. There's a reason why they're willing to give loans to guys like me that aren't Boza or Ani that that want to get into the space. And um, and if if you if you do something that they're looking for, they're, they're they, they incentivize it. That's definitely true in terms of, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say it's true. It's good to hear that they are providing those types of uh, incentives and opportunities for people that are not quote unquote bozas, because that was going to be my next point is, you know, a lot of people that listening to our show may feel like that could never happen. How could I ever, you know, build a, a apartment building or, or a complex? I need billions of dollars and these types of things. And that's the type of feedback that we hear all the time. And the reality is, is no, that's not necessarily the case. Sure, you do need to come up with some money and you do need to have some level of experience and acumen and time to do this. But uh, to your point, you know, CMHC finances these things with 5 10% uh, down on, on a, on a uh, apartment building, right? And there's tons of incentives to do so. So let's just circle back to how this even started and came about, like uh, retracing, because this is something I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear. You know, where did this initial thought come from to, to do this? I'll give a rough example of the best version of what this could look like. Okay, so imagine you pick a market and it could be the island, it could be the Okanagan, it could be in the Fraser Valley, but ultimately I'm just by affordability and what I could afford, and, and I have a partner in this as well, uh, is the numbers just make sense in the Okanagan or the island. And I'm personally just drawn to the island. My brother lives over there. I love the island and I want to be over there. So I want a reason to go over there. But imagine going to the island and seeing in a market like Nanaimo, four houses side by side, residential homes. They're in an, uh, an area where you can build a mid-rise, whether it's rental, uh, like I'll be doing a rental building, but you could do a stratified, doesn't matter. Um, but you you see four homes side by side. Each of those homes, call it, with a premium, is 800000 a pop. So four homes at 800000 that's $3.2 million. Say they're all rented out, you're getting residential loans. This is your world, but let's call it 25% down across the board. Or, or what would that be? It's 25% of, yeah, so 200000 a piece. So you have 800,000 in down payments uh, to secure four homes that are rented uh, across. Let's maybe add it, may, maybe make it 900,000 uh, just with the extras. And then once you have those four properties in a row, you've output 900,000 to own them. You have some cash flow coming in that are hopefully covering your costs. It's not, it's, it's a lot of money, but you've just secured, let's call it, I don't know, 30,000 square feet of development site. And, or maybe it's 35,000. The, you're out of pocket 900,000. To get to a development permit, it might cost you 200,000. To get to a building permit, it might cost you, call it 400 or 500,000. But let's just use 400,000. So you secure four homes, you're out of pocket 900,000. It takes you two years to go through the development uh, process to get to a building permit. You outflow 400,000 more. You're out of pocket 1.3 million, which is a lot of money. But at the end of that, if you get a permit approved, you could be looking at a development permit for a 60 unit building, could be a 70 or 80 unit building, could be a 100 unit building, depending on the market. The construction cost might be 10 million, it might be 12 million, but ultimately you've, you've secured four residential homes, you've got it to a building permit, you're out of pocket 1.3 million. And from, from that moment forth, then you look at, okay, um, what is the end building worth? You get an appraisal done. What, what, what is it going to cost to get there? And in a lot of cases, what you'll find is maybe, let's, let's use some basic math here. Say you, you, you have so you secured the land for 3.2. You have an appraisal of a building that's going to be worth 20 million. You're into it for 1.3, and it's going to cost you 12 million to build it. You, you're in at one three and you need 12 more million to build this building and it's going to be worth 20 million. So the, the gap there is huge, right? You just need to find the money to do it. So they lend the money to people that are qualified. They lend the money to people with high net wealth. And if you don't have that, 
you got to find some investors. You know, you could be you could be the lead on the project, and you could bring in accredited investors to help build that up. But it's it's a way that you can do a twenty million dollar project, but outflow you know nine hundred thousand in year one to one point three in year two and three, and so it's a big lever is essentially it. I don't know if I'm making sense here, but you're you're making sense. There's a lot of numbers. I think we'll have to put some visual elements in place. We're fall. I think we're following you, but I think the key what I'm hearing from all that you know any any listener who's interested in in going this route and maybe previously was discouraged to suggest here is it's not as far away as you think. First of all, use leverage to your example, and the word investor I think scares a lot of people too. It's like who who what are what are investors? What are those people? Well, I mean. Some of the investors are just people who own a few different residential properties and have leveraged those and have some additional cash, right? It depends on their situation. But, you know, essentially, the biggest takeaway for me to the audience here is it's not nearly as far away as you think. The process requires more diligence, more detail, and certainly a little bit more time or a lot more time than closing on a residential resale property. But the returns can be dramatic and it's not nearly as big of a gap as what most people, I think, think. Well, and, just to and, comment on that like piece of what you just mentioned, the the development process, you know, getting the building permit, the you know, the development per- permit, all these factors, actually designing what you're going to build, that alone is arguably a sellable asset just to get to that point, right? There are people, and developers will, th- that's what they do. A lot of developers just develop the land and not actually put a shovel in the ground, in the ground, so to speak, right? They just get it to your point, and people will pay good money just for that alone. Because that legwork is a lot. It's it's not as easy as you just made it sound, right? It can no, take a lot. There's a lot to it, and and we bought uh, one site with a development permit in place. So they they there's certain stages where you add confidence, and development permits one of them. So you can decide, hey, I'm going to get these four houses in a row, get it to development permit, and then reassess: do I want to take this through or do I want to sell it now? And then it, then when you get to building permit, you say, do I want to take this through or do I want to sell it now? But once you get that building permit and you start construction, assume you're into it until it's done. You don't want to sell a building halfway through construction, but there are certain milestones where you could take a step back and decide if you want to proceed. And the construction component of your project, are you partnered with a developer on this or are you guys basically hiring a contractor? Uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> so, but um, the likely, we'll, we'll probably have a construction manager and uh, you know, you know, I have a history. I, I'll, I'll likely see myself getting involved uh, in in some capacity with giving direction on design, yeah, yeah, and 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 just management overall. So I I, I get a kick out of that stuff. I want to learn. I'll be involved, but we will have a construction manager as well. I gotta ask, uh, not to uh, do a, too much of a one eighty here, but earlier on in the conversation, you mentioned that one of the other things you had been up to in the last couple of years was to purchase a lot for personal building, personal construction. I remember you telling me about this on the North Shore in North Vancouver, and you decided to, to maybe not proceed and go that route. Was that primarily because of the time and the energy of this project, or were there some other things that came up in trying to build your own uh, property there? I have a history of getting something that I want to develop and then getting exhausted with the city process of getting it to get approved. And then life changes so much by the time I have that approval that I just don't go forward with it for whatever reason. Um, and... And, you know, the heritage revitalization agreement that I'm trying to do in New Westminster right now, this is three and a half years in the making. The Deep Cove lot, I was, you know, the intent is to build the dream home. But a year, we're at two years of owning land without a permit. And the permit's probably a month or two away. It's close, but the costs of construction right now seem quite a bit higher, a little bit of a fear there. And if it's taken this long to get a permit, I anticipate a year and a half build, I'm concerned of $400 a foot construction costs or more. Uh, you know, there's this particular site is in Deep Cove. It has a creek. It has a forest. It's it's a large home. It's going to be an expensive build. And by the time when I look at all the math, uh, it's just a lot of money. And so essentially, uh, a month ago or six weeks ago, uh, we decided to change plans. A house came up that we liked, and we bought that instead. It's significantly cheaper than the cost of building a new home. Uh, and yeah, it, it was just like a, it was just a rational decision, I guess, Alex. <laughs> it was just, it, it got us to, we're, I'm moving from New Westminster, North Vancouver, bit of a COVID trend, you know, trying to get more outdoors in my life. And, uh, and I think there'll be some, I have three kids and want more outdoors in their life as well. Uh, and for, well, I think last time I was on the show, I had a place in the Okanagan and the 
the aha moment was I'm not a type of person that wants a second home. I just want to live in one home that feels like a second home. And so the, we're moving close to the forest at the base of Mount Seymour in North Van. And it's not Deep Cove. It's not the dream home that we're going to build, but we get there sooner and much cheaper. Yeah, you make a good point. I mean, I've been uh, looking at properties recently and and pretty well every home that we walked into, we're just running because we were either going to buy or build and consistently we just kept saying you cannot buy this land and build this house for this price anymore right even if you have to do some updates like that has just gone out the window whereas when you rewind three and a half years before the construction costs went crazy it was the opposite right like there was an argument that you could actually build for cheaper and there was profit in a project when you do build but it's completely changed so building is starting to get a little bit uh far and few between unless someone's heavily invested right and they've been waiting for a, a year for permits and they finally get them, they kind of want to see it through. But a lot of people are pushing away from that idea right now. 100%. It, it was not long ago. Like you said, the, the math made sense. You know, you could yeah. you could build at a predictable cost and, yeah. you know, rough timeline and it would you could decide if it worked out or not. Now, my thought is I don't think a painter or a tiler is going to make less money in five years. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to know what happens to land value. I could see a world where land value starts to decrease in some markets, especially when I look at what I'm going through in the district in North Van to get a building permit, like yeah. soft cost, six figures, same, same yeah. for heritage revitalization in New West. And when, when you look at other markets and how they streamline the development process um, or just look at the existing homes, I've never been more attracted to uh, like what really gets me going is a, is an ugly house with a good shell. <laughs> so I love, you know, and, and there, there's multiple ways uh, of getting there. You know, I, I'm, I'm buying a 1980s home uh, that, it, that had sunken living room. So it was kind of like a luxury 80 home, eighties home, but it has a really good shell. It's completely dated. So there's a lot of upgrades needed, but it's significantly cheaper and easier and quicker to update a house with a good shell than start from scratch. The development process with the arborist reports, and if you're on land with creeks or forests or anything, it, it can get very, very complicated. And I and I think the construction costs are going to continue to trend a little bit more up because I think wages are going to push up. There might be some materials that backtrack, but I just don't see enough, you know, young people going into trades. And I think they're going to get paid more. That's uh, that's a, a lot to take in right there in those last couple statements. But one thing that you said maybe a few minutes ago that I don't want to I don't want to gloss over was that and just generally speaking from investment perspective is that you you were excited personally emotionally invested in this project here in in the deep sh in, in in north shore i remember actually you sending me the drawings on it, it was an amazing looking place uh but but uh, looked at the not only just the numbers but also the time energy cost of doing so and decided for your lifestyle it no longer made sense. And it's really interesting when you talk to someone who's maybe getting into the idea of buying their first investment property or perhaps exploring something a little bit deeper. And the, I find that the biggest thing that people do not consider is the amount of energy that it takes. And sometimes it's not about just that bottom line profit. It is the time to do so because time is money, but it is also life. And so it's it's really interesting to see you balance the two out. And I know you're someone who's always been good at that. Anyone that builds, I tell them you're, gonna, you're, you're choosing to take up all your spare energy for a year. You know, you're, I, the way by not building, I just gave myself 500 hours of life back. Well, well put, well put. So, so you've opted to go, you mentioned land values potentially decreasing, which is really interesting to hear. And you obviously purchased a fair amount of land here, uh, North Island. Do you anticipate that that's going to be a trend more in the Vancouver region, even with the fact that we have such a small amount of land to build on, or is this maybe just a current trend for the next uh, couple of years? I don't think it's going to be a significant trend, but I could see markets like the, the teardown home that is clearly meant to be redeveloped in, say, markets like Tri-Cities of New West or even Langley. Um, I, I could see them pulling back a little. You know, if I were to throw up a number, let's call it 10 percent. And my logic there is there's a lot of um, 15, 10, 20 year old, relatively newer homes that are a, that are cheaper than replacement value that are available for sale in those markets. So when you look at, when you have a builder's hat on, you look at, oh, this 2007 home is 2.6 million and I couldn't replace that today for less than, call it 2.8 or 3, it, it, starts, it, it starts to eat at the land value cost. And then to, in addition to that, certain cities are stepping up step code requirements for energy code. Um, so not just the cost of construction are getting more expensive, but what the certain cities are requiring you to build 
are more expensive. Like District of North Van will require step code five, I think now or, or soon. And, and Vancouver's in that boat. And most cities are trying to increase their energy requirements, which makes a more expensive build. You take the profit out of it for a builder. And now you have all these builders who would buy land and build a house for profit. They're no longer purchasing. And your typical homeowners deciding against it because it's a nightmare and it takes two and a half years and it's expensive, right? So I, I totally agree. It was, it'll be interesting to see what happens. There's certain areas where you, you kind of, like if you're at that certain stage of your life, you have the funds, yeah. like uh, one observation, Deep Cove doesn't have a lot of nice homes. It has a lot of smaller homes. I think back in the day when it was developed, it was more of a blue collar area. And, and when you're buying $3 million homes, you kind of want, a lot of people want something over 3,000 square feet. So, you know, there's there's certain markets where you don't have a choice, but I would say if you're looking for a detached home in, say, Anmore or Coquitlam or Tri-Cities, where there is typically more options available for dated, newer homes, I, I would lean more towards buying existing than building in those markets. Just a question for somebody that's, you know, maybe in the same position as yourself, realizing that, hey, I've been working on a build for a year and a half of the city finally getting to a building permit stage and then now seeing, hey, there's actually an opportunity to do exactly what you just did and feel that's a better move. Is selling that property with all the work you've done with the city and the and the building plans that you have, is that is that a viable option now for you to flip that parcel? That's my intent. And I guess it takes a lot of work to get to a building permit. It can feel exhausting by the time you get there, but take my word for it, it's just as exhausting, if not more, taking it from building permit to end line. So despite the commitment you feel, if you've gone through a year, two, three years to get to that point and feel you got to take it the whole way through, I, I, I would strongly just say, look, if it doesn't feel right, use that, that ticket, that building permit approval as your exit strategy. And one thing that I'm like, what I'm doing right now is I'm getting really beautiful renderings done of these projects. So, you know, my, my fourth reading for a heritage home coming up, by the time that reading goes through, I'll have nice t a couple exterior renderings and interior renderings. Same for Deep Cove. There's no house there that exists, or or what exists there is really ugly. So the 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 my, my intent is to market what it will be, what it will look like, and hopefully catch a buyer that that sees that vision and wants to take it through. There's a lot of builders that want. Well, I wouldn't say it's a huge part of the market, but I do feel that there are a lot of builders in that space that really value a building permit approved. And, they, and there are builders that want to keep their people busy, they want to keep their trades busy, and they don't need a big fat margin every time. They're just always in the business of building. If somebody did want to make tweaks to that, are they are they now in jeopardy of going through some more red tape and, and with the city because they want to change maybe you know a slight part of that design? Yeah, you don't typically, I mean, every project's unique on a heritage. You don't touch the exterior, so don't even try to tweak that. On yeah. on anything else, anytime you tweak structure, you're going to reopen a can of worms. So if you're just tweaking cosmetic stuff, no big deal. But if you're moving walls, it might be a problem. So a lot of what you've been saying here in regards to, obviously, red tape on the city, I mean, it's not surprising for us to hear that, but maybe for other people listening and to hear that when the government is obviously, just, obviously suggesting that they're going to be uh, piling cash into... Uh, all of these different cities and districts and so forth to help us get to a little bit of a higher amount of supply, which leads us into kind of the next conversation around how does this, what you're seeing and what you've been experiencing the last couple of years, what do you think this means for supply, which is, unless you disagree with me, probably the number one reason prices continue to go up and probably will in the next couple of years after a little dip here. I don't think there's enough supply. I think we all agree on that. <laughs> and I, I think we all agree that there's no sign of a light coming that that's going to change. You know, I, I'm just waiting for, I don't know, the uh, provincial or federal government to take the zoning out of municipal's hands or, or create some sort of like, I don't know, zoning czar that, that forces rezoning in cities. Uh, but, you know, one there's a big problem of nimbyism. Like it, there's the, the supply for, in the markets we work in, say I live in New West, moving to North Van, Tri-Cities is big, Burnaby's big. They call it, uh, a third, call it a 1,500 square foot townhouse and up. That I don't see any scenario of that supply increasing enough to meet even close to the demand. Yet they might be able to make micro townhouses, skinny townhouses to keep up with demand. I think they can make one bedroom, two bedroom condos in excessive demand. You know, when you look at the 20 tower projects around Edmonds and Burnaby and, and how many, like 100 towers coming down the pipe in Burnaby and more can come in the surrounding cities. So I think the, the box in the sky apartment, I, I think they can, they can pull, they can work that, but there's just not enough houses. 
and there's not enough larger townhomes. And those, I, I, you know, I think the, I think those, those markets will continue to climb. There might be a little glitches on the way, but uh, you know, I see this latest increase in rates, uh, not pulling back a lot of those prices, but just checking them. Like I think those were going to run another 10, 15, 20 percent, and this rate hike checked it. Uh, and and in some areas, maybe certain products are pulling back, but I'm not seeing it for for what we're selling. So first and foremost, you just suggested you agree with us from a perspective. We agree, obviously, supply being a major issue. You just told us about the the challenges of getting uh, one uh, property built, not notwithstanding renovating something, and then of course the you know the process of trying to build out an apartment building. Um, the government's publicly stated in their most recent federal budget that they're going to be providing millions and millions on millions of dollars. To, to some type of a cause to, that they have not specified to assist in building more supply, whether it be rentals or more properties and so forth. You just mentioned to us that you don't think they're going to be able to build the right types. Well, man, I'm probably putting words in your mouth so you can stop me, but I think I heard you say you don't think they're going to be able to build the right types of properties, which would likely be a three bedroom plus for families to live in. Um, and what we're going to likely see is an excess of one bedroom condo studios and small, small townhomes. Is that the way of the future and do we think that's what's going to happen in in the Vancouver region going forward and what does that mean well let's 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 kind of separate a few Poco Langley I think they have a bit of a reputation as being more development friendly so they you know you're gonna see more options going more buyers going to the markets where the housing exists Port Moody New Westminster District of North Vancouver don't necessarily have the most development friendly reputations you know New Westminster it's it's frustrating when you understand how why the supply is pinched and 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 who makes the decisions around it it's it's very frustrating you know and an example is you know new Westminster just approved a, a six-story mid-rise affordable housing building which got a lot of a lot of resistance because it was in a house neighborhood like it backs onto detached homes and there's going to be a six-story low rise, low rise there but it was it's affordable housing so from a political standpoint there's a big win there but as a realtor i I can't help but think that this is a city that has a dated OCP that needs to be updated. The OCP doesn't have enough incentive for, for construction. You can see that by the lack of construction going on in the city. They also, they haven't rezoned. They need to rezone these properties to, to streamline the process to give builders uh, confidence that they can build what they want to build because an OCP might say you can build this, but by the time they go through the two, three year process, some neighbors say no, and the council listens to them and the development doesn't happen. And so, and, and there's acres and acres of prime development land in Lower 12th that is a study area. Study area means we don't know what we're gonna do with it, we're not gonna commit to something, developers gotta send us a proposal. That doesn't encourage development, right? So you, you need to outlay confidence, you need to encourage investment. And until some cities wrap their head around what it takes to encourage and incentivize investment and, and development, um, and not you know worry about re-election and, and the mob of the neighbors coming, like that's what needs to change and i don't see that changing in certain areas that's a really tough change to happen right and then when you know the government comes out and says hey we're investing x amount of dollars into this it's like well what like you can't just throw money at these things you need the right people you need the right culture in place to actually make these changes right and it's it's unfortunate because it is the municipality that has all this control where it should really have some federal or at least provincial oversight and to give you an example, I have a land assembly in New West, and one of the homes on it is a 100-year-old home. And I met with, uh, I, had, I had another land assembly call me the other day, and they have four homes on this one that all are 100-year-old homes. City needs more townhomes. It's zoned in the OCP for townhomes. But if I'm a buyer and I phone the city and say, hey, I'm interested in this site, what can I do with it? They're going to say, well, this house is over 100 years. This is over 100 years. These are all going to need heritage assessments. Um, we don't know what, you know, the OCP says this, but we don't know if you, you know, you might have to move those homes. Those homes might have to be part of the development. And, and ultimately, unless you're a local that's been through a heritage project, you're just going to move on to the next, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to go through that. And to add to that, the density is not even worth it, you know? So aside from getting, you know, like there, it's a very minimal density increase that you get for that long process. So yeah, frustrating. I could vent for hours on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get you on with the city, I think. 
Oh yeah, I'll uh, I'll vent to them too. There we go. There we go. Okay, so let's let's uh, circle forward because we covered a lot of ground here, and there's there's I'm mean, probably digging into that one forever. We don't want to get too political. Supply is always going to be an issue. I think we all agree on that. <laughs> so that is going to continue to be an issue. So talking about today's current trends, then, and what's going on right now, you know, obviously you just mentioned it yourself. It's probably more short term than long term, but we saw things go up. I explained to my clients like a hockey stick on a graph over the past year and a half for a variety of reasons, but. Um, you know, with with uh, public sentiment looking appearing to slightly change or shift in the short term, uh, you know, prices seem to not be going up in that hockey stick trend. Maybe in some areas we're still seeing some increases, but there's a lot of articles and and postings and the news. And again, I don't we don't really watch the news, but they come our way anyways. So we might as well talk about it. About price points now going to co come right back down and uh, and likely continue to stay down. Believe it or not, that's what people are saying. And I hear this from clients all day long. Long, although again may not agree with it because I don't know what the trends are where this is coming from but that being said over to you James uh, if you were to hear someone say to you well it looks like prices are gonna collapse in the next you know one to three years and I'll just wait what would you say to someone like that I don't think uh, I don't think a house in Heritage Mountain Port Moody a house on a quiet Glenbrook North Queens Park Street in New West a house in North Van name the quiet street I, there's certain markets that are too resilient I just don't see it backtracking. I see maybe some sellers getting less lucky. There were some anomaly sales in February, March that felt like, oh, that was, you know, the market was here, but that sale was still a little bit above. So I, I don't think those lucky sales will come through. But if I were to guess the, the top tier product types that people want that they just can't make more supply of uh, will be the same prices in November as they are today. And, and, you know, I, I'm, why I'm saying that is, you know, I had a client offer on a Lynn Valley home last night that got six offers and, uh, I still run into bidding wars every week. Like our team still runs into bidding wars every week. The, the areas that being said, uh, had a client also look at a one bedroom that would have got multiple offers a couple months ago, but now she has a day to breathe because it didn't get any. And, uh, there are buyers have a little more time to digest and think. So there are more scenarios where they can get subjects where they negotiate one on one, um, but particularly for detached homes where I find myself often, uh, they're still getting quite a bit of multiple offers. And prior to this podcast, I thought I'd take a refresher and look at the last thirty days of action. And like in every market I looked at, Burnaby, Tri Cities, North Shore, New West, the markets that I that that were more prominent, fifty percent or more were getting full price or above of the sales. So for detached sales, so more than like half or more are still getting multiple offers. The median days on market was eight in pretty much every market, which means their most listings are still selling a week. And that's the snapshot for the last 30 days. I think that label of good product is bang on because like every single client I'm working with, they're eager, they're trying to buy. But they're like, we go out on weekend with our agent, we look at 10 properties and nine of them suck. Like they're on a busy road or they're in a bad building or like the, the neighbors, the streets, horrible, right? So that one property that pops up, that's actually a good product. Like there's people looking for that and that's going to drive multiples, right? The stuff that's sitting based on what I hear, I'm not a real estate agent, obviously, but there's typically something wrong with it. It's overpriced or it's just not the property that's ideal for your common buyer, right? The stuff that's sitting is sitting for a reason. It's usually in an expensive market and it's not enough house or it's too high of a price. And, and I say the expensive market, not enough house, just because I'm, there's a lot of markets where 2.2, 2.5 million is now a 2000 square foot home. And, you know, where I bought a home, we, we, we bought a home that's nearly 5,000 square feet. It's a large home, but houses that were half of its size were 200, $300,000 less in the same neighborhood. So uh, there's, uh, I think there's a lot of, um, some of the homes that are struggling are just the the really basic homes that were built 40 years ago that are now two and a half million. But um, if oh, I guess one thing that I'll say is high price points are start do show signs of struggling. So if you isolate, call it, you know, if you take the good homes and you really isolate the the, the pool, uh, it's going to be you know bidding war, full price. It's going to be a strong, strong seller's market. But the moment you look at detached homes over three million, it drops to like a ten percent sales ratio, and it's more of a buyer's market. And and that that sorry three point million and, and call it Burnaby New S Tri City area where and and that would probably apply to Langley and Cloverdale as well. So the the higher price points are where more of the opportunities are. They're probably more likely to pull back, 
but also buyers buying over three million are less sensitive to interest rates. So your guess is as good as mine on that one. Well, and that's an interesting point to talk about the interest rates. I mean, I mean, because only just in the last three months has it been. You know, people generally speaking are sensitive or hypersensitive when they see an interest rate, but most people that we talk to don't actually know what the impact is until we go through the numbers with them. Right? What does this mean on my budget? What does this mean on my bottom line? Which leads me to the next point about the stress test and interest rates increasing. I mean, we're in a super unique environment where the Bank of Canada is, thinks that you know jacking up the the uh, the key overnight rate is going to have some kind of massive impact on the economy. Economy, which I, I really, I mean, sure, there will be a, a sudden impact or a shock, so to speak, but it's not going to stop inflation around the country. Um, with that being said, I mean, you probably talk to people, or at least your team, and when you're getting them together and talk to people from an interest cost perspective or a payment perspective, are you hearing many buyers or from your team, are you hearing many buyers talk about interest rates as a reason that they're not buying? And do you think that will hold people off long term? Or do you think this is more of a temporary, scared, nervous kind of phase, and it's just going to get uh, people get used to it? What are your What are your general thoughts on that? I haven't had someone not buy because of interest rates. I think arguably there's probably, in the, we're probably in the world where people are trying to buy that have held rates that are better. So there might be a bit of that. Um, there's just been, it's hard to, it's hard to attribute the emotion of a new buyer or, or client that's, that wants to move, but is kind of call it fed up or, or just on a break. It, it's, it's because there's so much going on. It's more than just interest rates. You know, it's, it's, it's the market was the hottest it's ever been. And then a war happened and the interest rates jacked up and then things slowed and the, and also the financial markets kind of got a hit. So I think the I couldn't attribute it solely to interest rates yet because ultimately our rates are still pretty low. You know, they're just higher than they were before. Um, so my thought is, I think we can actually absorb a higher rate. If I were to guess, I'm, this is not my world, but let's just put it out that I think that detached market and the townhomes that I that I was mentioning that are pretty desirable and and even though this doesn't qualify call it a Yale town one bedroom too because I think there those are one of the if I had my investor hat on and residential that might be one of them I think if the uh, rate went up another 0.5 like 0.5 percent I think the market can handle it I think beyond 0.5 percent is where we start seeing some trouble and I think if the market if the bank rate went up 0.5 percent I think certain products that may be on the fringe of desirable, um, that are more generic, uh, like call it a one bedroom in Fraser Valley, maybe. Uh, well, maybe not because first time buyers. So, so uh, I, I don't know. Whatever those products are that are, every market seems to have some that are a little bit more oversaturated, more supply than demand. Those might pull back, but I, a good product I think can hit, can handle higher rates. I mean, what we're, what bank rates three point two right now. You got it. Yeah, I, I mean, first and foremost, from a, a, a affordability standpoint, I mean, that's one consideration, but the stress test itself is still in place. If interest rates go up to 3.7, most banks are prime minus, you know, 0.5 or better sort of range, somewhere in that ballpark. And even if they change slightly, if the stress test goes up to 5.5%, that's a 1%, 1.5% difference in affordability. So it's not noticeable at all. I, I think, uh, James, my, my sentiment, and I don't know if you share it on these situations, that it's generally speaking, it's the media that clouds our minds and people don't dig into the numbers of the stats you know first example of that is when i see someone's application i see that they generally carry a fair amount of unsecured debts credit cards lines of credit at 19 percent interest or 10 percent interest or a car loan at seven percent interest but they're worried about a mortgage rate being a half of one percent albeit mortgages are a much larger loan that being said your actual cost of borrowing if you're spending 150 bucks a month in in credit card interest i think you need to be more concerned about that versus an interest rate on a bank going up half percent because as we know rates that go up come back down right and that's maybe not in credit cards but in mortgages and you can always switch that up um last note because i went on a rant there and dean or derek hop in at any point in time we talked a little bit about recommendations and i don't know if you're willing to jump into this or not but just generalizing one thing that i had brought up in our conversation was a suggestion that our clients who while the values are high before they change qualifications rule they should from an investment perspective or lifestyle perspective look to get that increased value in a HELOC or a home equity line of credit. But you, you also said that you agree and that's something that you were, you were thinking about as well. Any thoughts on that or, or recommendations there or you just generally agree on that one? Yeah, I, I think I just generally agree that um, you take what a bank will give you. It doesn't mean that you have to make payments on it. You can, it, what, what you need, you can put in say a closed five-year variable or fixed and then what you don't need you have as a credit line that's open. Um, I mean, right at this moment, there's investment opportunities. And if I had extra credit available, I'd take advantage of them. 
And, and just for that reason alone, whether it's a renovation, whether it's uh, buying that rental property or, or buying some financial investments, wh whatever it is, I, 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 I'm a big believer in taking what the banks will give you, and, but being smart with it after that. Yeah, we push that all day, especially because nowadays going through the process of getting an approval and securing financing is not easy, right? Like they need every single document, they need appraisals, there's lawyers, there's costs. If you're going through that process, whether it be a purchase, renewal, refinance, like get a HELOC. Unless you have a f uh, spending problem, then maybe reconsider. But if you're pretty financially stable, there's absolutely no reason not to get access to that line of credit. I mean, we see a lot of people going into retirement, right? And it's like, let's get as much equity as we possibly can at your fingertips before your income drops dramatically because the way the world's going, qualification is going to get harder and harder and harder, right? So people a little bit later in life definitely need to consider that. Yeah, I think the qualification part is a good note. Like if, for, for my personal situation, you, you know, when you have a business, you can manipulate your income. And, uh, and I have manipulated our income to get a real big mortgage. Uh, that doesn't mean I want my income to be manipulated next year after I have this big mortgage. I want it to be yeah. back down so I pay less taxes. So, yeah. you know, if you, you have, there is a logic to pay more taxes to get a better mortgage and then, and then shift right after that. And that's yeah. kind of my approach. For sure. I mean, and then just in general, just the property qualification, the fact that if you are in a, you know, a higher price point, you may see a, a dip in value. And so if you go to get that, you know, property appraised, say in six months, it, it may be worth more now from a from the standpoint of an appraisal. So to shore up that home equity line of credit to be as big as it possibly can be based on the value of your home, um, there is no better time now if we are going to start to see a correction of, of any sort. Because as soon as the market turns, as much as, you know, it's selling for X amount, appraisers get conservative and uh, and they will make that, that value not as pretty as it could be maybe right now. All fair points. Well, we got to leave you off with a, a quick little question here. I feel like we might have answered it. So, uh, I mean, you can circle back and repeat the same thing, but we always like to, to end off and say, okay, in this kind of a climate, in this quote unquote changing environment with interest rates adjusting and you're seeing all these different properties, talking about land values, Jamie is out there looking for property today. What is what is Jamie looking to buy right now? Where Where is the opportunity in the marketplace for you? You know, if I were, it depends on the budget, but let's call it, let's say it's lower mainland that you're buying something for one. <laughs> well, well, I'll give you a bunch of answers here. I'd probably lean towards, if it was say under 800,000, I'd lean towards a one bedroom in Yale town or a two bedroom condo in Port Moody. And I say that because the rents are pretty good. And I think there's, I think the Yale town condo arguably hasn't really moved, has been at the same price since 2017. So um, in a world with more immigration coming, I think that's one of the markets that might benefit from the rents. I also believe that rents are on the rise. So, um, and the two bedroom in Port Moody is mainly just because their rents are noticeably a step up from the surrounding markets. And if I could get close to Rocky Point in the Brewers Row, uh, I just think that's a good long-term bet. So th those would be my two picks for say, and then that would also be the same as like Lower Lonsdale, North Vancouver. I think that Port Moody and Lower Lonsdale are in the same boat. Uh, if I had a little more budget, um, I'd probably, and, and could afford a detached. I mean, I, I think the up-down post-war 1950s home with a suite is always a solid investment if you can get close to covering your costs. Um, and that doesn't, it, it, it would be foolish of me to say that New Westminster is going to outperform Coquitlam or Poco or Maple Ridge or Langley. If you look at the stats and you have a strong opinion of one outperform the other, just realize after 14 years in the business, I've realized stop thinking that you know. <laughs> so so my thought is any any house with a suite, if you can afford, say, un, up over a million and under two, and if you can get over two million and you're looking for an investment, I'd be looking at, say, duplexes that you can turn into quadplexes. Um, you know, I, I think the undervalued asset, but the non-investment is a big house in like Anmore. You know, if you bought a 5,000, 6,000 square foot home in Anmore, you couldn't replace it for the price that you're going to pay for it. So there is an upside angle there, but not a cash flow angle there. Um, and if you're open-minded geographically, I think the numbers work far better on the island and in the Okanagan, and even far better than that in Edmonton and Alberta. So the further the numbers in Edmonton are ridiculous, and and Calgary are ridiculous compared to what we're getting here. So, but lessons learned from me in the past from my Atlanta experience. If you're investing outside of where you live, invest where you're willing to go for fun, you know, and vacation. Don't invest somewhere you have no one intent on going because if, if, if things go poorly, you got to get over there. And, 
I uh, feel like all those uh, potential Edmonton investors are going to stop heading there real quick. That was a long rant, though, Alex. I don't know if I covered it. No, I think, honestly, every listener here should be taking notes at all, everything that you suggested right now, and and uh, and, and that would assist a lot of people in, in getting a, a better understanding, not only to where, but why, if it, if it matches their goals. So, man, you hit the nail on the head. I really appreciate it. That's been, uh, it's awesome. We went everywhere from, uh, you know, your North Vancouver uh, lot to uh, building an apartment building with way too many numbers for a podcast. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> to a little bit of a, a political rant and then where we end off this has been great jamie thanks so much for uh, your understanding uh your, sorry, your time and for uh breaking this all down definitely uh appreciate you coming on we're going to put all the information in the links so people can find you if they need any assistance with real estate obviously uh where to find you and uh how to reach out thanks again for joining man yeah thanks for having me on